Looks like we have some people trickling in. Hi, everybody. We're just going to uh, give people a few minutes to trickle on in here, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us today. Welcome everybody. I'm going to give uh, just a few more minutes to let some more people trickle on in. Recording in progress. All right, I think we're going to kind of go ahead and get started a little bit here. Um, again, we'll, we'll wait for a few more people to trickle on in before we start the full presentation. But just to kick it off a little bit, my name is Isamarie McIntyre. Um, oh, I'm sorry, give me one moment. Oh, wait, it's your computer, I think. Okay, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Jeanette, um, our executive director, is on the call with us, so she'll be speaking here in a moment. Um, you would think, you know, with the pandemic, we would have our tech figured out, but I do not have it figured out, so bear with me. Be, be nice to me. Um, but welcome. We're very excited that you all are joining us today. Uh, we are doing a farm demonstration event. Uh, what we will be doing is showing two pre-recorded videos. One of them is on a vineyard and the owner will be um, sharing conservation practices that he implements on his vineyard. And then another one will be from um, Jamie Whiteford who is with the Resource Conservation District and he'll be sharing information about different funding opportunities so that you can fund some um, conservation practices on your farm. But before we get started with that, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, if you got the email about the pre-survey, I ask that you please complete the pre-survey. We do use the information gathered to make program changes and improvements, and um, we do value that input, and we do actually put it to use. So I'm going to share that pre-survey link in the chat right there. It only takes about four minutes to complete. It's really not very lengthy. Um, if you do complete the pre and the post event surveys, you will be entered into a drawing to win a $50 Visa gift card. So if you live anywhere in California, I'm sure the gas prices are high where you're at, just like it is for me. Um, so please complete the pre and post survey and get a gift card and fill up your tank or do whatever you want with that money. Okay, um, for questions, we ask that you use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can enter a question in there. We will answer it either via the chat or on, you know, live. Um, we do encourage you all to talk to each other in the chat. Um, one of my favorite parts about joining webinars is that you get to communicate with one another and um, really get to meet a lot of interesting people. So please talk to each other in the chat. Um, let us know where you're from, why you're here, what you hope to get from it. We're really happy to have you here. We do want to say a big thank you to the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts. Um, they actually provided a grant to Farmer Veteran Coalition to host this webinar. And without their support, we wouldn't be able to provide this information to you. So thank you to them. Um, everyone's camera is off and everyone is muted. So if you have something you want to say, um, go ahead and put it in the chat and we will 
have some time after the presentations to where if you wanted to ask a question live, you can raise your hand and um, you can actually ask that question live. Um, Jamie Whiteford from the Resource Conservation District may be able to hop on after his video presentation. And Peter Work is also going to try to hop on after his um, presentation. So if they're here, then they will be able to answer your questions. All right, I think I covered everything in terms of housekeeping. Um, let me start my presentation by saying again, my name is Isa Marie McIntyre. Um, I am the grants manager here at Farmer Veteran Coalition. Um, we are going to view uh, a, a farm demonstration video from Peter Work, who's the owner of Ampelo Cellars down in Southern California area. And we will follow that up with Jamie Whiteford, who's a district scientist with the Ventura County Resource Conservation District. And he will be sharing information about how to fund um, some of the conservation practices that we see, but also others. Before we get into that, I'm going to introduce Jeanette Lombardo, our executive director. And uh, Jeanette, did you have something you would like to share? Well, first of all, I wanted to welcome everyone uh, today uh, to the Farmer Veteran Coalition webinar. I'm joining you today from our um, office here in Woodland, California. And this webinar is part of our uh, series of, of webinars we're doing with the California National Resource Conservation Service. Um, as, as I pointed out, we're gonna be uh, hearing from Peter Work and his, um, him and his wife, Rebecca, they have, uh, they're immigrants from Denmark and they have about 82 acres in the Lompoc area um, with the Ampelos uh, sellers, and we're gonna learn a lot about them. We, we chose them for this demonstration farm because we do have a lot of folks in California that are members that are interested in, in vineyards. And so we're hoping that you, you learn a lot from them. We were introduced to Peter from um, one, of our, one of our partners, Coastal Vineyards Care Associates. So I wanna thank Jeff Newton for the introduction um, to Peter. So Peter is, he's, um, has three certifications actually. Uh, he's certified organic vineyard. He has uh, Detmer biodynamic certification and he has a SIP certification. So I think you're gonna enjoy, he's gonna be talking about quite a few different conservation practices, um, nutrient management, composting, cover crops, um, you know, soil conservation in general, uh, buffer strips, uh, intercropping. Uh, so I think, you know, off the top of my head, there's quite a few more. So I think you're going to enjoy it. I thank you for joining us. Please make sure uh, you fill in the exit surveys as is re has requested. Um, that really helps us in planning our programming in the future, as well as seeing how you benefit from what we're showing you today. So thank you and enjoy. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jeanette. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm just gonna share a little bit about myself. Um, I am an Army veteran. I joined the Army fresh out of high school and I joined to work on the multiple launch rocket systems. If you're wondering what the heck that is, um, I was too when I was 17 years old and fresh out of high school. It's that picture right there on your screen, uh, the big hunk of metal right there. I actually worked on that. I was in the army for eight and a half years. I did two deployments to Iraq. And while I was on my first deployment, I actually met my husband. Um, he is also an army veteran. He is he was in the 82nd Airborne Division. He was a, a 11 Bravo paratrooper. Uh, we have three kids and we live here in Woodland, California. My husband got injured in Afghanistan on his uh, fourth deployment in 2012 and he lost both of his legs and uh, sustained a, a moderate traumatic brain injury. Um, we've been fortunate enough to do some work in legislative advocacy for caregivers and for veterans. And he found his new purpose in, in beekeeping, which actually led me to Farmer Veteran Coalition. I was a Farmer Veteran Coalition member before I worked here, and I believe strongly in the mission. And I'm very happy that you all are here, and I'm sure you all believe strongly in the mission as well. So for those of you who may not be as familiar with Farmer Veteran Coalition as, uh, as I am, um, I'm going to share a little bit about what we do, who we are, and um, how you can get more involved. And so Farmer Veteran Coalition is a national nonprofit. Um, it's, we are dedicated to getting veterans in agriculture. Uh, Farmer Veteran Coalition has been around for over 10 years now, and we operate on two primary beliefs. 
the first being that veterans possess the unique skills and abilities needed to be successful in farming. Uh, things like resiliency are definitely necessary, um, but also that ag offers purpose and opportunity and physical and psychological benefits to veterans. Um, I can tell you firsthand that that was my experience whenever my husband started beekeeping. Um, it really was, I mean, it was a life changer for him and for our family. We are a membership organization. We have over 35,000 members in all 50 states. We represent all types of ag, big ag, small ag, um, organic. I mean, anything you could think of, we, we definitely have members who do it. Uh, we are a free membership organization. There are no membership dues or membership fees. And if you are not a veteran, I know we do have some people on the um, webinar who are not veterans. I'm gonna share a little bit more toward the end of the presentation about how you can become a member and why you should become a member. Some of the things that we do here at FAC is uh, career counseling. A lot of times we'll get phone calls into our call center of veterans who are transitioning out and you know maybe they want to get into ag, they're not really sure. Uh, we can talk them through it and give some resources to kind of help guide them and get them thinking about what they want to do. We also help with business planning. So if you're a veteran who has an agriculture business already, maybe you need help with a business plan or um, identifying um, crop plans, creating a crop plan, we can assist with that. Um, also financial resources, if you're looking for um, a loan or something specific, maybe you're trying to redo some fencing, like we have resources to um, point you toward the right direction in terms of financial funding for that. We do have mentorship. We're actually working on a, a national mentorship program right now, um, but we do offer mentorship. It's really a great way to learn agriculture from another farmer veteran. We also have training apprenticeships and internship programs. If you want more information about that, I will share our email and you can reach out to us and we'd be happy to connect you to one of those programs. Um, in addition to that, our veteran members get membership discounts through Kubota, FarmTech, Dedant, um, all the rest of our discount partners that are listed on the screen. We are very grateful for our discount partners. We really appreciate their support. And essentially we just meet the veteran where they are, whether they have a family history of farming or they have never been on a farm in their life, uh, we are there to help guide them and support them. Two of our primary programs um, are Homegrown by Heroes and Fellowship Fund. Uh, Homegrown by Heroes is essentially the official farmer veteran branding of America. So if you see that little label up there that has the um, veterans on it, uh, that is a Homegrown by Heroes label. And it identifies that a product was made by a veteran. So it's a really great way to connect farmer veterans with the community and it, it really offers a way for the community to support farmer veterans. Um, we have over 2,400 HBH producers and um, the, we just see a huge growth in our um, Homegrown by Heroes label participants. So if you want more information about that, again, I will uh, provide an email where you can reach out and get some more information about how to become a Homegrown by Heroes uh, veteran. Our second program, which almost everyone knows about is our Farmer Veteran Fellowship Fund program. Um, we provide grants ranging from $1,000 to $5,000 to purchase farm equipment, um, and any supplies that can really help a veteran grow their business. Uh, we've given out $3.5 million since 2011 to over 800 farmer veterans. Uh, we, we actually just closed our application for our fellowship fund. Um, it's already been closed and we will be announcing our 2022 fellowship fund awardees here pretty soon. Uh, we really appreciate our major sponsors, including Wounded Warrior Project, Kubota, Tractor Supply, and Farm Credit System. Speaking of Kubota, we have a wonderful partnership with Kubota. It's our Gear to Give program in where we actually uh, are able to provide pieces of equipment to our farmer veterans who apply to our fellowship fund. Um, we've been able to give out uh, five pieces of equipment each year and over 31 pieces of equipment have been awarded since 2015 when the Gear to Give program started. So again, that program is associated with our fellowship fund program. If you have more questions about that, uh, feel free to reach out to the email that I'll provide at the end of this presentation and we'll get you some more information about that. 
Our annual stakeholders conference is coming up. Um, we, we had to do a virtual conference in 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, we did do a conference in 2021 in Tennessee and it was great. We had a wonderful turnout and we are so excited about our conference this year and it'll be in Oklahoma City. If you want more information about it, if you're on our membership list, you will get information about it. One of the perks of being a member, um, you get the information first and um, more information coming on that. And we'll uh, share information about how to register for that conference here shortly. Okay, so how to become an FBC member if you are not an FBC member. You go to our website, farmvetco.org and on top left of the screen, you'll see the join button. If you click on that, it'll show you this window right down here that has veteran and not a veteran. So even if you're not a veteran, you can sign up for membership. Um, you don't get the perks of membership discount and you obviously you can't apply for a Homegrown by Heroes label or the fellowship fund. Those are specifically for veterans, but it is a great way to find out what Farmer Veteran Coalition is doing. And it's a great way to stay connected whenever we have webinars like this, because this webinar is open for veterans and non-veterans. So. If you want to learn more about what we're doing and to stay in touch with Farmer Veteran Coalition, if you're not a veteran, it's a great way to do that. Go ahead and sign up for membership. So here is our, our support email and our support phone number. If you have any questions about any of the information that I've provided, um, you can feel free to reach out uh, to, by these methods right here and someone will get back to you. And I will also post this information in the chat. So don't worry if you, if you didn't get to catch any of that information. So again, we just wanna thank um, the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts. Um, they are the reason why we're able to provide this information to you. And so we really appreciate their support. And I am happy to go ahead and move along to the Peter, Peter Works video. You're gonna be really, um, it, he has such a really interesting story and he has a really uh, he, a real appreciation for veterans and what, what we do. So I'm gonna go ahead and share his video. And please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we're happy to answer them either um, you know, in person or, or we'll type the answer in, this, in the screen and everybody should be able to see the Q&A. Hi and welcome. My name is Peter Work. Hi and welcome. My name is Peter Work, Employers Vineyard, right here, Employers Sellers. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to meet with all of you out there. First of all, thank you for your services. I really appreciate what you guys have been doing. Keep us safe here. That is very important for our country. Even though I speak with a fun accent, hopefully you can understand it. No, I'm not from Brooklyn, I'm from Denmark. But I've been in this country for 33 years and actually uh, five years ago had a great opportunity to become a U.S. citizen, which I'm very proud of. But back to what's going on here, this is about a um, great opportunity that my wife Rebecca and I, we got some years ago where we actually became farmers. We're going to be talking about how fantastic it is to have the opportunity to work with soil to work with plants, to work with the climate around us, wind, weather, sunshine, to work with the insects, and to work with wonderful people, and to create a meaningful product. I don't believe that there's a better job in the world than being a farmer, because we as farmers, we create something incredible meaningful. We create food, we create things that means that people can exist, and in our specific situation, we make wine. I'm sure a lot of you guys out there enjoy a glass of wine as we do, but that's what we do right here. Let's talk a little bit about our background and our story. So 
Rebecca and I, my wife and I, had a very different life because we were in corporate America. I came to the United States in 81 to study for a year, 81 to 82, went back to Denmark, my home country, finished my education, but fell in love with the United States in 1981. I actually did a two-month trip on a big motorcycle from East Coast to West Coast, a little bit Canada, a little bit Mexico, came through this area right here where we are, which is in California, Southern California, Santa Barbara County, Santa Inez Valley, Santa Rita Hills. Drove through here and just fell in love with this place, wanted to come back. Uh, I finished my school for a year, went back to Denmark, graduated, came back in 1988. Worked as management consultant in Price Waterhouse for a number of years, first in Wall Street in the late 80s. Price moved me around, uh, Denver, Miami, Dallas, and finally in 92, I landed on a project in Los Angeles where I met a wonderful blonde woman, Rebecca. Ada fell in love with and we married in 94. Left in 94 to take uh, different careers. Uh, I was a director of technology in Walt Disney. She was a consultant in a Canadian consulting company. And in 99, we joined forces uh, work-wise again after we'd been married for five years. Uh, we had some extra money from some stock options and I had a dream of one day doing exactly what I'm doing here. Of one day becoming a farmer and one day also to make some wine. So we bought 82 acres of beautiful raw land and had no idea about farming. Had no idea about the magic of again working with soil, plants, mother nature and great people. So we started totally from scratch when we bought our land in 99. Hired a great vineyard consultant to help us to do a master plan of these 82 acres. And based on his advice, we planted initially in 2001, the first 15 acres of vineyard, which is in the way back over there, planted 18,000 vines in the summer of 2001. We all remember 2001 for something horrible that happened in September. And actually that morning, Rebecca and I were we were still working on a project in corporate America. We were flying from LA to East Coast for a meeting that I had that morning in Wall Street. And that was that Tuesday morning, 9-11. We landed at 6.30 in New York airport. On the way to the airport in LAX, the night before my secretary called me, my meeting in Wall Street that morning, next morning was canceled. So otherwise I would have taken the train from Path uh, the path train from New York Penn Station into World Trade Center 1. The meeting was canceled. I never took that train. I would have arrived at a quarter to nine. And the first plane hit oh, just right after that. So we stayed in New York. Uh, it took us four days to get back home. Got back to Los Angeles. I said, where are we going, Rebecca? Back to our house in LA or up here? She said, let's go up here. We spent some days up here thinking about life and decided that things could have ended very differently. So now is the time to make a change. And what we did was we jumped into it at the end of our one, left the corporate world, had built a little house up here in the meantime, which is home sweet home. And then we learned how to become farmers. To get into farming is something that you think that farming is very simple. You just plant something in the ground and give it some water and then it starts growing. It's a little more complicated than that. And that's what Rebecca and I, we learned because there are so many things we had to understand. We had to understand, of course, what soil is about. We had to understand what are the components in soil, what are the chemical, organic, physiological components in soil. We have to understand how plants operate. Photosynthesis. We all know what photosynthesis is. Some of us can remember it from school, but it is more complicated. Krebs cycles and four times around and all that stuff. We had to understand about nutrients, nutrient balance. We had to understand about the importance of water, irrigation. We had to understand about the seasons. So what happens with the plant and the soil throughout the year. One of the things we did from the beginning was we were smart enough to recognize what we are not smart at. And therefore we hired consultants to help us out with the things that we needed additional help on. We hired a great vineyard consultant to help us to guide us about what to plant, where to plant it, how to plant it. 
irrigation system, how to deal with getting water to the right place at the right time, and also getting used to all those challenges that you have as a farmer throughout the year. Because it is not just about, well, it's farming, you put a seed in the ground and give it some water. It's about what happens with Mother Nature, what happens with the wind and the weather. As a matter of fact, right now, here we are, and I'm checking, as I always do, several times a day, I check the weather forecast for the next 10 days. We have a wonderful little devices, our iPhones that we always carry with us to study what's going on. Right now, I was just talking a few hours ago with my foreman about we may get some rain coming in Sunday night and Monday. Well, we are trying to get some water on the vines right now into the soil. We have the cover crop and therefore how much are we going to irrigate today, tomorrow and the day after, depending upon how much rain are we going to get in. So we constantly have to follow what Mother Nature is dealing of cards so that we can learn to react accordingly. Throughout the growing season, we are in Santa Barbara, Southern California, where we have six months with no rain. And those are six months where the plants are growing. So those are the six months where we have to irrigate. So important when you grow things is to make sure that the plant has the right conditions. It needs the right water, right amount of water at the right time. So in the springtime, we would start irrigating based upon how much rain we got that winter because that provides moisture that's still in the ground based upon the soil condition. More clay we have, the more water holding capacity there is and therefore the less we need to irrigate in the beginning of the growing season. If we don't get rain here over the next couple of weeks, then we know we are going to water pretty much once a week throughout the growing season. Growing season goes on to when we pick, when we harvest, which is typical September or October where we are. So the water balance is very important. What we do, and that is our vineyard consultant, Jeff Newton has taught me that, is we can measure things in the ground. We can measure um, evapotranspiration, which is based upon the climate and the water, weather conditions. We can measure, measure different ways. We can measure the water consistency and the water pressure in plants. But what we do is more important than that is we use our senses, first of all, our eyes. So we look at what are the vines communicating. The plants are talking to us. The plants are communicating to us. We as farmers, we need to learn how to make these observations of what the plant is telling us. So for instance, when it comes to water, as the shoots are growing, which they are just starting to, we're just starting to see bud break now, then the shoots are gonna grow out. They become longer and longer. These little buds will grow to, they could be up to like six, seven feet long throughout the growing season. But they will always have a shoot tip that grows. And then they have the little nodes, the positions where there can be a leaf, there can be a cluster in the bottom, or there can be a tendril, these little arms. And what we do is we look at where the shoot tip is compared to where the tendrils are. And if the tendrils are longer than the shoot tip, we know that that plant has got enough water. If the tendrils are starting to be a little shorter and the shoot tip is bypassing it, or the tendril starts getting a little dark in its tips, that means it's starting to get thirsty. It's just a little example of you as farmers need to learn to make observations of what Mother Nature is telling you and act accordingly and make actions, make decisions about like watering. Let's talk a little bit about nutrients. Nutrients are very important, just like you need good food, organic, of course, we want to be healthy. You need vitamins, we need little supplements to what we eat. Maybe you need a little extra B12 vitamins if you're a vegetarian or whatever it is that you need. The same with the vines, the vine needs nutrients as well. I have found this vineyard that you're looking at behind me since 2006, organic and biodynamic and sustainable. Uh, three years conversion program took us to certification in 2009. U.S. Department of Agriculture, CCOF, organic, and Demeter, biodynamic. And we 
done that since 06, certified in 09. And based upon that, we, of course, do not use artificial fertilizers. Understand the value of fertilizing. Understand that there are conditions sometimes where you can't do organic, can't do biodynamic. We're lucky we're in a situation where we don't have certain pest pressures that would force us to drop organic biodynamic farming principles. But where we are here, we can do that. Fertilizing is very important. The vine needs fertilizers, and it gets the fertilizers through the soil. And we need to get fertilizers into the soil. NPK, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, the macronutrients, and also some of the micronutrients. How do we get that? So compost building, a very, very important part of our farming principles. Um, okay, so what's really cool about this compost is that to, to think that way about something that comes from as a waste of one process goes into another process. And that's what's happening right here is that we have, oh, these are stems, right? This is actually, I can see this is Pinot Noir stems here. And you think it's just like worth nothing. No, actually, as it falls apart, it will release the nutrients it has in, in it. Nitrogen, potassium, we got seeds here. This is what's from the, um, after the fermentation of the grapes, these are the skins and the seeds. Also a lot of great nutrients that goes into this. And what's so cool is when I go in, dig into this, I can just feel the heat of it. It's already getting so well decomposed and it's going to provide this fantastic fertilizer that we're going to spread out in the vineyards here in about uh, six months, seven months from now, yeah, eight months from now. So just wonderful nutrients coming from Mother Nature. The way we build fertilizers here, the way we build compost here, is by using what is a waste product of one process to become the input to another process. Here's an example. At harvest time, when we go out and we pick clusters from here, and we pick about one million clusters a year, a lot of grapes. These clusters have got the grapes, very important. We take the clusters to the winery, we destem them, so we have a machine that will, through centrifugal effect, it will get the grapes to release from the stems. The stems go in a stem bin. Sometimes I put a little bit of stems into the fermenter to get a little extra flavor out of that. But most of the stems I bring back here. Why? Because there's still a lot of nitrogen and potassium in the stems. And that goes down right down there where we have our compost pile. And we build that up, all the stems. The same thing when we're done with fermentation, when the yeast has converted all the sugar to alcohol, then we throw it all into the press press it out, and what is left, that's called the pumice, the solid that's left, still, same thing, a lot of nitrogen, potassium, we bring all that back here to the rains, and it goes down to the compost. When we do green cuttings, mowing the lawn or whatever, cutting some branches, whatever, all that goes down in the compost, so we built a healthy compost up over 12 months, and it's something that you as farmers, you can all do that, and you have to do that, you should do that, is Everything that you can put in the compost that makes sense, and you can do a lot of read up about that. Uh, scrap material from your kitchen, a lot of great nutrient value in that. Bring it in to your compost. If you happen to have some farm animals, we have right now about 50 chicken at peak time. We have up to about 200 chicken. And we just, last week, we just collected from the chicken, their manure, a lot of nitrogen in that goes into the compost as well. So you build up this healthy compost, since we are biodynamic uh, in our farming, we add certain biodynamic preparations, chamomile, dandelion, stinging nettle, oak bark, yarrow, and that uh, goes in to build up a healthy compost. And that compost will then sit and go through composting process, and when that's finished, you have this really fertile uh, nutritional material, these fertilizers, and we spread that out in the vineyard. We do that typically late November, early December. Each vine gets a shovel full of this compost material, and that's a great way to fertilize. These are all great principles for farming. But one thing that I think is 
so important is that when you do farming, number one, learn to trust your senses. Learn to use your senses to make observations. You have your eyes, you have your noses, and if you're doing vegetables, fruit, you have your taste buds. Learn to observe things throughout the year. Write things down. Take a lot of notes so you can go back and look at it. Spreadsheet, Excel, we got so many different spreadsheets that we're using. But make a lot of observations, especially when you harvest whatever you're farming. Make observations about that. There are some observations that are factual, that are uh, actually numbers. In our case, because we grow grapes, there's sugar, there's acid, there's pH, there's yen, whatever it is. But there are some factual things, but they are also what your senses are telling you. So you've got to learn as farmers to make observations, and you've got to learn to trust in your observations, to trust in your senses, to make decisions. That's a scary thing. I'm, I've got a master's degree in engineering and a couple of business degrees, and I was never taught to use my senses to make decisions, because we are taught to make decisions based upon facts. But when you move in to become a farmer, you have to learn to use your senses and make decisions based upon your senses. Farming is an incredible rewarding job. It is, like I mentioned earlier, one of the most rewarding jobs, if not the most rewarding job. But it's also a frustrating job because you constantly have things that don't go as you expect. And that's what you have to get used to. When you're in corporate America, like I was, there are things that you can control to a high degree. When you're a farmer, there are so many things you cannot control. First of all, of course, weather. You cannot control that. There are a lot of things happening out there. It's Mother Nature. We have pests out here. We have rodents out here. Can't control those. We have dogs. We can barely control the dogs. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that you have to get used to that Things are frustrating when you're a farmer, but nevertheless, it is just incredibly rewarding. Every year after Christmas and after New Year, we get pictures, emails people are sending us. Look at what we open up with our friends and our family here for Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve or the anniversary or their birthdays, whatever. And to see a bottle of wine that Rebecca and I made and see a picture of that as a part of celebration. Makes us really feel that we are doing something very, very meaningful. Especially when we are doing it based upon our principles with organic, biodynamic and sustainable. Let me talk a little bit about sustainability. So, um, fertilizing is very important. We talked a little bit about that. It's important that these guys, the vines here, they get nutrients. And we can do that through artificial fertilizers. But that's not the way that farming should be done. That's not the way that it was way back. They say it's conventional. It's not. It's new and modern. That's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to build up healthy topsoil. And trust me, when we bought this land over 20 years ago, this didn't look like that. It looks like that now because of the way we've been farming. A very important part of it is what I got right here. So this is something I seeded. This is cover crop. And what this is, is it is like these guys here. Look at them, they're flowering, they're beautiful. So here we got sweet peas. Mm, tastes like peas, tastes great. These guys are fantastic. And together with, we got some veg in here. Some of this stuff here. This is actually uh, that one, the white one, that's a fava bean. These are fantastic because, sorry, because they are nitrogen fixers. They will take up nitrogen. Nitrogen is about 80% of the air we are breathing. The rest is mostly oxygen. But they will bind the nitrogen. They'll fix the nitrogen for us. These guys are not that tall this year. Sometimes they can be like four feet tall but they still bind a lot of nitrogen. So what we're gonna do with these, let them go for another week. We're gonna get a little bit of rain coming in here on Sunday, Monday. And then probably in a week from now, we're gonna go out and mow them one morning 
and then the same afternoon will come back and will dish them back into the soil. Thereby, we are literally putting ton and ton of nitrogen into the soil. Nitrogen becomes ammonium, that becomes nitrate, that goes in the ground and it goes down to the roots so that our vines can uptake those as fertilizers. We've done this for many, many years now and we can see again what the soil looks like today. Didn't look like that 20 years ago when we bought this land. This is about healing Mother Nature, healing the soil and turn soil into something that's really productive. Think about the importance of soil. Almost everything we consume comes from soil, right? The cows are eating what comes from here. They give us the milk, they give us the meat, vegetables, fruits. Most of what we consume comes from soil one way or the other. Therefore, topsoil is so important. It's a very important resource we have. So let's take care of topsoil. Let's take care of Mother Nature as good as we can. There's more to it than those components. Those are, of course, the most important component, but there's more to it. What about people, your labor? What about the economy in it? What about social responsibility? Like what I'm doing right now to sit here and talk about why this is important. And there are other aspects as well. So uh, many years ago, a set of principles were defined for sustainability farming here in Central Coast, we have a program called Sustainability in Practice, or SIP, which is a great program that was developed and implemented the first time in 2008. Uh, here at Amplos, we were part of the initial pilot program, got certified in 2008 as sustainable. Later on, a broader reaching program, a California-wide program called uh, California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, was formed and uh, it is a great program. It's really based upon best practices, where this organization collected best practices for all the different aspects of farming. So whether it is about consistent pressure in your irrigation system, whether it's about how to deal with waste material, whether it's how to deal with uh, taking good care of your employees, so that they have, you know, retirement program or English as a foreign language program, whether it is communicating well with your neighbor and be a good neighbor. There are so many different aspects of sustainability. So if you haven't, if you're not familiar with this, read up about sustainability farming, depending upon what you're growing out there. There's a lot that you can learn because it's all about None of us should start from scratch and learn it all ourselves. We have to learn from each other. And there's so much knowledge sharing, especially through these sustainability programs out there. So read about it, check it out, and learn from what the other ones are doing. Learn from your neighbors. Hey, buddy. Learn from your neighbors. Often there are coalitions, often there are communities, like we have here in Santa Barbara, where we have a wine growing alliance where we meet now and then, sometimes we have tailgate meetings where we get together, we share experiences. We all know that we are damaging Mother Earth, which is horrible. Carbon footprint, nobody talked about this 20 years ago, but we know how important it is to take good care of Mother Earth, you know, the greenhouse effect and all these things. Um, what we do here, because we are farming operation, we're doing something really good, right? Because you know that as a part of photosynthesis, then there's a carbon uptake. We bind carbon in what we do in our farming, in our vineyard right here behind us. And that's a really good thing. Uh, there are some very, very good calculators. You can find carbon sequestration. You can find it on some of the sustainability websites out there. And that gives you a, a good warm and fuzzy feel, but it also gives you an idea about how can you do a better job in carbon sequestration. An uh, example of that is how do you work with soil? And there's a lot of debate going on about that right now, in, especially on, uh, around tilling versus non-tilling of soil. Uh, we do believe in tilling. We do believe in minimal tilling. We do believe in cover cropping. We do believe in giving the weeds an opportunity to exist, but not to take over everything. And those are all part of healthy soil building and all part of good carbon sequestration. 
That is what we do here with, with the CO2 footprint. We have a very good CO2 footprint. A whole vineyard here is run on solar power. We have two solar uh, power panels, five and a half kilowatt at the house and at our workshop, the garage, and eight kilowatt in the vineyard, which is connected to our pump. It's still on the grid, so most of the time it pumps electricity out in the grid, but when the pump runs, we take from the grid. But net-net, we basically pay almost zero dollar just connection fee. So very good from a CO2 perspective to have these uh, solar panels. Air conditioning system, we don't use that. We use a uh, night cooling. We have a system that based upon outside temperature, inside temperature, it will bring in cold air from the outside to cool the inside of the building. Um, it, it's a very low energy system. And there's, in general, there's a lot of things that you could do to be as carbon neutral as possible. Uh, glass that we use, glass is a very important thing because most of the glass that's used for bottling wine actually comes from far away. It comes from, from Mexico, from Chile or from China. Uh, we avoid that. We uh, use uh, as much as we can only US made glass. We had some problems with it here over the COVID crisis. But before that, we were 100% on US made glass. Now we're working on getting back to it, which means less transportation, less CO2 footprints. We don't use foils on the top of the bottle, that metal or plastic thing. It's a waste of material. Doesn't serve any purpose beside of the aesthetics. The labels we are using are printed on recycled paper. We use uh, brown boxes. The white boxes for wine are bleached with chlorine. That's not a very friendly way to do it, etc., etc. So, in general, really focus on being as close to carbon neutral as you can, being as environmental conscious in everything that you deal with. Once again, I want to say thank you to all of you for getting into farming. It's such a wonderful thing. And once again, thank you again so much for your service. We appreciate it. Cheers. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. I know you are um, actually able to join us and answer some questions. And so we really appreciate you, uh, number one, doing that video for us and also being willing to uh, get on the call with us real quick and answer some questions. We appreciate that. So it looks like we have um, one question. Can you explain the difference between um, certified organic and biodynamic certified? Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you. Right. Um, so <clears throat> organic, biodynamic, how do they compare to each other? It's a great question. So I, I'm not good at fast answers. The uh, biodynamic principles were defined by the uh, Austrian scientist, uh, philosopher Rudolf Steiner in 1924 as a way of re, uh, taking the soil that the farmers have problems with and healing the soil, bringing it back to a great equilibrium. Some of the things that I talked about out in the vineyard about healing the soil. So it's really about how can you create good, healthy soil or repair the soil without using a bunch of artificial things from the outside. So Steiner says, use what you as farmers have on, the, on your land and use that to heal the soil. That's why we got compost, as I was talking about, we've got the different biodynamic preparations that I talked about, quartz crystals, common, et cetera, that really helps on supporting the vines in their photosynthesis and providing good nutrients through the soil. Now, um, this also deals with a timing aspect. 
So there's a biodynamic calendar that talks about when is the right time of, uh, of the week or of the month really to do things. It has to do with where the moon is in regards to the 12 constellations, et cetera, et cetera. Organic is really a subset of that that was derived later on. Once we get, you got uh, into like, you know, like 20, 30 years later, so what organic uh, deals with mostly is in regards to what you should not be using. So when you're organic, you cannot use artificial fertilizers. When you're organic, you cannot use certain pesticides. Pesticide, we all know, is a, is a common denominator for insecticides, herbicides, fungicides. So you cannot use any herbicides if you're organic, like Roundup, horrible thing. You cannot use artificial insecticides. There are some insecticides you can use. You can use fungicides, but again, fungicides that are non-synthetic. Uh, organic doesn't really deal with the processes like biodynamic does. So for Rebecca and I, biodynamic is really about taking organic to the next level. There was another question from Janet that came in about water monitoring. Uh, so a little bit about water monitoring, water management, I also talked about that on on the, the video here, it's so much about treating water as a very scarce resource. So we don't wanna use more water than we have to. We do do monitoring on an ongoing basis of what mother nature does. So of course we monitor how much rain we've been getting. And based upon that, we make our irrigation program. Where we are located close to Santa Barbara, we have only about 40 inches of rain a year. And it always comes in the winter month from now on until September, we will not see a drop of rain. And that's when the vines are growing. Therefore, we have to irrigate and we irrigate very carefully. So just a few hours ago, I was with uh, our vineyard consultant, Jeff Newton, out in the vineyards. And we were you know, talking about starting irrigation program next week, where we look at how long the tendrils are, where the shoot tips are, like I mentioned in the movie. And based on that, we make individual decisions block by block about how much to uh, water. So we make sure we don't water too much to the vines. Wow, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And um, I am gonna share a link to the CCOF website. Uh, Farmer Veteran Coalition members do get a discount to the CCOF um, application. Um, but we do have another question for you if you wouldn't mind. It's from sure. Ariana. And the question is, do you incorporate the cover crop into the soil? Yes, we do. And it's a great question, Ayana. So the copper crop you saw, I was looking at and chewing on there. As I mentioned, it is a very important source of nitrogen. And what we just did about three weeks ago, so if you went out in the vineyard right now, it looks very different. So about three weeks ago, we went through and we did the mowing of all of it. And then after we mow it, we disc it into the soil, literally two tractors driving behind each other. And we disc it into the soil, and thereby the wonderful nitrogen that comes from the cover crop becomes ammonia that becomes nitrites, which is a macronutrient through the microbial process in the topsoil. So it's a very, very important um, process that we've been doing for like 20 years. And that is the reason why our topsoil is now so healthy as it is and provides nutrients via the root system to the vine so the vines can uptake that. And uh, just to add one more thing to that, um, mm -hmm. one of the things that we also noticed I was in the vineyard yesterday morning and saw a nice little ladybug on the leaves of one of the shoots that's coming out right now. They're great, uh, they're great insects, the ladybugs, because they go after aphids and leafhoppers and bad guys. So we really want to encourage their life there. But the problem is when we mow our cover crop, we are taking their habitat away from them. Therefore, we only seed nine out of 10 rows. Every 10th row, we let it grow native and we don't mow that. So right now, if you look at our vineyard, you'll see that every 10 row, 10th row, it looks like the tractor driver forgot to mow it. No, he didn't. But that's because that becomes, I call it a temporary housing arrangement for the ladybugs while the vines are growing. Once the vines are growing, they got leaves and these every 10th row starts browning out. Then the ladybugs and the good spiders we got will see that there's a new place for them to live and they'll move in in the canopy of the vines, which is where we want them. Nice. Now, now speaking of the rose, our next and final question, also from Ariana, is how do you manage weeds under the row? Yeah, I used to, it's, it's another great question. I used <laughs> to think about 
you know, we, have, we will drive around in wine conches when we just started getting into this and we will see a vineyard where everything was nice and brown and cleaned up under the vines. There's nothing growing there. And we would say, that's a good farmer. And then we saw these vines where there were like weeds growing left and right under the vines. And we said, yes, a sloppy guy. And, and today I think, and, and together with me, a, a number of other winemakers and, and grape growers that I respect tremendously, we think 180 degrees difference. Because when I now see uh, vineyards where everything is nice and brown in a very nice uh, strip under the vines, I know that that's called Roundup and that's a horrible thing. And then when I see weeds growing under the vines a little bit here and there without being like six feet tall, I know that there's life in that soil and that's what we like to see. So um, we do not hoe any longer. We used to do hand hoeing, send out a crew of people with those big hand hoes and do that. And not only does it cost a lot of money, it's very hard work, it's not good for the back, but we did it three times a year, spent a lot of money on that. Uh, what we do nowadays is that I want to have the weeds under some control. So we have constructed this great uh, tool after the tractor. It's a big blade. It's a metal blade that's about uh, like two feet long and it sits on a rotator. So it doesn't hurt the roots of the vines. And that blade will go like, like two, three inches down in the ground probably. And it literally cuts the roots of the weeds along the way. We probably clean up about, I don't know, 40, 50% of the weeds under the vine, but it still leaves a lot there. So that is how we like to keep the beets under control so they don't take over everything. But I have no more uh, desire to clean everything up any longer. Right, well, thank you so much, Peter. We appreciate you um, taking the time to film that video. And uh, we certainly appreciate you taking the time to answer questions and you know, you're, you're happy to stay on. I understand if you have to hop off the call, but we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank you to Randy Ryan. I think he did a fantastic job editing that together. It was a pleasure for me to watch it. Thanks for having me on the program. Oh, thank you. Okay, next we're going to move on to uh, Jamie Whiteford, who is with the um, Resource Conservation District in Ventura County. Um, Jamie is not able to join us today. He's actually out in the field right now. Um, but we, we did do a, a recording of Jamie speaking and he is the, uh, he has a PhD in soil and water science. Uh, he has been with RCD since 2011 and has managed numerous projects related to soil health, climate change, and just agriculture in general. Um, Jamie has been instrumental in managing RCD and um, RCD's efficiency programs and soil monitoring and testing programs and uh, working with regulatory compliance. So we're very happy to have uh, Jamie Whiteford speaking on some of the resources that are available if you want to implement conservation practices on your farm. Hello, everyone. Give me a moment while I get everything set up here. All right, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Probably should switch. Hold on one second. This one here. Okay, so hopefully this one will um, show up. So, um, hi everybody. Sorry for the. Uh, sorry for me just talking to myself. Um, my name is Jamie Whiteford. I am the district scientist with the Ventura County Resource Conservation District, and um, I want to thank. Um, I want to thank the veteran farmers for inviting me to speak. Um, and I apologize that I can't be there in person. I actually have a field event scheduled for tomorrow. Um, I'll try to, to join by call from the field. Um, but in lieu of, of being able to present, I thought that probably the best thing to do would be uh, just provide a Zoom recording. Um, I hope that you find it, it useful. Um, so my name is Jamie Whiteford. I'm the district scientist at the Ventura County Resource Conservation District. A lot of what I'm gonna discuss 
um, while it is going to be kind of specific to the Ventura County Resource Conservation District, um, I'm hoping that a lot of the information will actually also translate to your, your area. Um, and uh, there's a lot of overlap between what I'll discuss here and um, the resources available uh, wherever it is that you farm. So um, as I said, my name is Jamie Whiteford. I'm the district scientist here at the Ventura County Resource Conservation District. And my goal today is really just to introduce you to your local RCD. Um, and by virtue of that, um, hopefully introduce you to a broad spectrum of uh, resources available to you. And there we go. All right. <laughs> so I outlined the presentation that I'll be giving today. I just want to give a brief introduction to myself and um, my district. And then I want to talk about uh, RCD structure and the partners that we work with. Um, overview of our mission, overview of our priorities, um, sort of introduce some projects that we work on. Um, then I want to get into funding opportunities um, that you sh should be aware of, and then uh, next steps that help us help you. Um, so about me, um, I've been 10 years, well, 11 years now, I guess, with the district. Um, I focus, my work focuses on ag projects and ag-related research, um, which actually covers a great deal of stuff um, because ag lands, in addition to doing, you know, traditional agriculture, they also um, are land stewards and they do a lot of um, carbon farming. They do a, a lot of other things that isn't just related to food production. Um, I've got a background in soil and water science uh, from University of California, Riverside. And I am a proud husband of a wonderful, beautiful wife and a father of a former Marine, um, did four years, now is um, seeking his associate's degree. And then my youngest is uh, a welder. So a very proud family of um, young sons who made good choices about us. So the Ventura County RCD is what's considered a local unit of, of government. Um, and this is true for all resource conservation districts. Um, and we're considered a local unit of government uh, under the Public Resources Code of the state of California. Um, the Ventura County Resource Conservation District isn't alone in this distinction. That we're one of about 100 RCDs. And all of um, the RCDs are sort of uh, uh, under the, the guidance, if you will, of a larger California Association of RCDs that kind of handles um, some of the lobby, lobbying um, on the RCDs behalf and also some large scale um, block grants that they can apply for um, that thing then can be used for other local RCDs. Um, so as a local unit of government, that doesn't mean that we have any specific uh, regulatory authority or anything like that, um, RCDs. Um, are not uh, able to tell you what to do. And we are only able to assist you in whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, so a little bit about um, our RCD. Uh, we're a special district like all RCDs. Uh, we have a certain jurisdiction, if you will. I mean, in our case, our jurisdiction is uh, a mirror um, of uh, our county's boundaries. So within our county's boundaries, we are able to pursue the activities that support our mission. And our mission is in resource conservation. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the role of the RCDs um, as it fits within the partners, uh, such as funders and such as landowners, is a, is a critical one. Um, so you as landowners, um, whether you're a farmer, in your case, or whether it's a city or whether it's a other you know, NGO um, who has a resource concern that they'd like to address, um, y'all could apply for funding. Um, and in many cases, you should apply for funding directly from funders uh, that you know, might be giving you technical or financial assistance to be able to mitigate whatever that uh, issue or challenges that you have. And as a landowner, um, or as an NGO could go to funders at the local or the state or the federal level 
Um, but oftentimes, um, seeking funding is time consuming and the process could be, you know, a little bit convoluted. Um, and so it can, you know, be a barrier to landowners uh, efficiently and effectively ask, accessing those resources. And so that's sort of where the RCDs come into play. So um, RCDs are, at least in the case of the Ventura County RCD, um, funded entirely by grants, well, almost entirely by grants. We have a small stipend from our county because they like to support our work. Um, but, you know, we go after grants um, that we then administer and provide to landowners or um, other organizations uh, so that they can achieve the work that they, they need to do. So the way it works is that um, the landowners will typically come to the RCD because the RCD as a um, local unit of government um, has the authority and the capacity uh, to go after funding um, that's provided by local, state, or federal um, level agencies. And um, the reason that the landowners often come to us uh, to work with them is because, you know, we work in their area. So we're known to them. Um, we've worked with, you know, landowners uh, for a long time. You know, our our district is around for 70 years or, or so, and, and even longer than that, actually. And so we're trusted because, um, you know, we've worked with all of these um, individuals or organizations. And, you know, over the time that we've sort of um, done what the district does in terms of uh, implementing projects or seeking funding for projects, we've learned how to go about it efficiently and effectively. And so we're capable um, in being able to secure funding for whatever those priorities are. So the way it normally works is um, RCDs will work with landowners to apply for funding, uh, and then that funding will then be funneled to the landowners um, to support whatever their needs are. And then, of course, the RCD is supported um, by being able to administer that grant on behalf of the landowner. In terms of sort of our internal structure, um, uh, as district scientist, I'm considered uh, an RCD staff. Um, so my role is to work directly with partners, work directly with farmers, um, and identify what those resource needs are, uh, and then find an appropriate grant that would uh, provide assistance and then write the grant um, along with the with the landowner. Um, and then once the grant is funded, assuming it is, then we would implement the project that the, the uh, landowner was seeking to get funding or technical assistance with. Um, however, staff answers to our executive director. So our executive director uh, handles sort of the grant administration as well as the fiscal um, matters, so invoicing and things like that. Um, and then both staff and the executive director are, um, are will answer to our board of directors. Um, we have seven directors. Um, our board is comprised of, um, you know, landscape architects, uh, um, researchers, and then ranchers and farmers. So um, our board of directors are either appointed by the Board of Supervisors or um, they are elected. Um, and they all are, you know, um, local to our area um, so that, you know, they're serving their, their communities that they're um, embedded within. Uh, in terms of our um, partners that we work with, uh, this is quite a busy slide, um, but all I meant to demonstrate here is that, you know, on the local and the state and the federal side, we work with all kinds of different conservation partners as well as funders. So, you know, locally we work with um, Farm Bureau, we work with University of California Cooperative Extension, you know, we work with land trusts, et cetera. Um, at the state level, we work with funders like the Wildlife Conservation Board um, at the state of California, the Department of Conservation, State of California, um, you know, California Department of Food and Agriculture, California Fire Safe Councils, et cetera. Um, and then at the state level, I mean, at the federal level, we work with, you know, uh, again, a number of different partners. Um, examples include like the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, um, EPA, 
uh, et cetera. So um, the point being is that we work with uh, a number of different funders. And so again, it goes back to being capable and aware of opportunities that might um, be useful for you um, in um, mitigating whatever issue you may have or in um, achieving whatever goals you may have. I want to um, I want to kind of talk about a particular project um, that fits within our mission. Um, but first, I'll go ahead and just read our mission statement. So our mission is to collaborate with landowners, government agencies, and willing partners to facilitate the conservation and restoration of Ventura County's natural resources for current and future generations. This is our mission statement, but it's going to be very similar to the mission statements for um, all the other 100 RCDs um, in California. Um, and I want to talk about this particular project. So there's a map that you see in front of you. Um, this is a project that um, the landowner, you know, has been a partner of ours for, for quite some time. And um, our relationship goes way back, um, but most recently we um, worked with them to secure a number of different funding uh, opportunities. And so I kind of want to walk through them because they're they're relevant to this to this audience, I think. So um, several years back, we started working with them to secure funding. Um, and what they were doing at the time is they were converting uh, some of their area from intensely cultivated row crop over to organic avocado. And so uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to apply for funding um, so that they could protect their um, new avocado trees from wind damage. And so they worked with us um, and we applied for funding um, through the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Healthy Soils Program. And the goal there was to secure funding so that um, the, that money could be used to put in a windrow. So we got that funding for them. So they were able to put in two windrows of uh, native willows to help uh, protect their new trees from wind damage. Uh, after that was secured, uh, we followed that up with uh, an additional application to a separate funder. Uh, we applied to the Department of Conservation and the goal seeking funding through the Department of Conservation was to put in uh, additional pollinator habitat keeping in mind again that this is an organic avocado operation uh, so we secured funding through the department of conservation to put in um, pollinator habitat so these were native uh, flowering species um, ranging from uh, annuals uh, such as milkweed uh, up to perennials such as toyon etc and these were to complement the wind rows so uh, we, in addition to the hedgerow plantings, we also sought funding to improve the irrigation system. Specifically, we wanted to replace their filter station and upgrade their plumbing um, to the filter station because in order for us to support both the willows and the, um, and the hedgerows, we needed to have um, uh, adequate irrigation and specifically we wanted to avoid any, um, any plugging of the system. So we wanted a new filter. Um, this is from groundwater, relatively shallow groundwater. And so um, we were able to get that funding for them. And so they got uh, they got uh, some significant upgrades to their irrigation system in addition to the hedgerow planting. And then to follow that up, we um, we saw an additional need for further irrigation improvements, storage tanks, um, pump improvements, et cetera. So we applied to the California Department of Food and Agriculture sweep program which is the state water efficiency and enhancement program and we were able to secure funding for that so um, they'll be able to put in some soil moisture sensors so they can track the irrigation uh, and they also will get further improvements to the irrigation system beyond um, what was provided through the department of conservation so this is just uh, i think a great example of how things can stack and if you work with the resource conservation district and you have a vision for what it is you would like to see um, the goals you'd like to see your operations achieve, uh, then you know we can go about doing that by um, finding adequate funding resources to help you achieve those goals. I want to um, 
go over some of the other projects that we have um, that align with the RCD's mission and particularly our strategic priorities. And the reason I do this is uh, I want to do this is because um, you know we RCDs do a lot of different things. Um, and again, I'm focused on agriculture because that's simply where I fit in best at this particular district. And I have colleagues who do restoration, et cetera. We all work together, but you know, um, in this in this kind of um, there's so much work to be done that it's it's good to have a sort of a, a more of a focus. And so my focus is on agriculture, but um, we do a whole bunch of different things beyond that. So um, our priorities are water resources, fire preparedness, soil and climate resilience, invasive and resistant species, land resource management, and wildlife habitat. These are just bullet points that are pulled out of our five-year strategic plan. Um, and ultimately, you don't see that these will deviate much in the future. Um, but this sort of bullet list of strategic priorities is going to mirror what many of the RCDs are seeking to do, um, are already doing, and um, it sort of establishes our goals. And with these goals in mind, then we have um, you know projects that we go after to sort of um, address these priorities. So. Um, you know, we have a, a program that helps um, landowners with irrigation and nutrient management um, um, uh, goals. We um, have projects that, you know, will help harden the landscape to protect uh, structures or landscapes against wildfires. Um, we're interested in how um, practices that occur on ag lands um, impact climate. So, you know, is there carbon sequestration going on? Uh, is there greenhouse gas emissions going on? Um, we're interested in, in ensuring that we uh, eliminate invasive and resistant species so we can reduce pesticide use. And we have a particular focus on um, a flammable um, invasive weed that uses a lot of water in, um, in riparian areas. And that's a rhododonax. So we have a very robust program of trying to eliminate that from our watersheds. Um, we want to make sure that we do enough research uh, to be able to see what are good practices. And so, you know, in our land resource management um, priorities, uh, we're looking at what kind of stewardship practices can happen uh, to protect against erosion or to protect against, um, you know, leaching of nutrients and, and water quality impacts. And then wildlife habitat is, is also important um, and is one of our priorities. So in addition to the pollinator habitat that I discussed earlier, you know, we are also doing, um, you know, more specific things like uh, monarch um, overwintering habitat restoration. Uh, the picture that you see at the top of the slide is from a, a overwintering, historic overwintering site. And in this case, our volunteers are putting in a, a second line of eucalyptus to assist with um, having a, 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 an area that's protected from wind. So when monarchs are in the area, they can harbor in there. Um, uh, so they have can persist throughout the winter um, when the breeding and migratory um, season comes around in the spring. So I, I wanna circle back to some more specific um, resources that you should be aware of um, and that, uh, you know, it's, it's, really pretty much tailored to probably what your needs are. And I discussed this earlier, and this is the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Healthy Soils Program. I mentioned this uh, in one of the other um, projects that we had, um, this one paid for windrows. Uh, the Healthy Soils Program, it's um, administered by the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and the focus of the HSP program is on carbon and climate. Um, comes about every year, usually opens in the fall and the winter. Um, there generally are um, individuals as part of organizations that can offer you assistance um, in the application process or provide you technical assistance um, if you're awarded funding. Um, so you should really uh, be mindful of that. Um, you can always look up CDFA HSP program information on the web. So, um, you know, you can Google that or use whatever browser you like to get more information of, about the program itself. Um, in our case, in our area, which, you know, I consider to be Santa Barbara County and Ventura County, only because um, I, we work very, very well with our, our city in Santa Barbara County, um, you know, 
Healthy Soils programs pays for soil-based uh, practices like compost and hedgerows. Um, and so you can see this list of projects that were funded ranging anywhere from $20,000 or close to $21,000 up to almost $100,000 to do a variety of different projects that you know, help conserve soil, help build soil, health, um, you know, and help conserve water and all those types of things. Uh, so um, if any of these practices are of our interest to you, then just be mindful that the Healthy Soils Program could be an option for you to consider to help um, you achieve these, these goals. Similarly, um, I discussed earlier the SWEEP program. Uh, SWEEP is, uh, again, it's the funding through SWEEP is provided through the California Department of Food and Agriculture, just like HSP. And the way that the RCDs are involved is that oftentimes we're the ones who can provide you the assistance needed to successfully apply for the, for the program. Um, and then also we can usually assist you uh, with uh, implementation or we can assist you with um, other technical resources. Um, now, unlike HSP, uh, SWEEP has a different focus um, and it's on water and energy. So um, while HSP focused more on soil-based practices, um, the SWEEP program focuses on practices that conserve water and reduce energy use. So things like putting in flow meters so you can um, better schedule your irrigation uh, volumes. Um, soil moisture sensors and other technologies that allow you to monitor your soil moisture so you have better control of your irrigation uh, timing. And then um, also if you have an inefficient pump, um, then you can get funding to uh, convert over to a more efficient pump. And again, this will help with, um, with climate mitigation uh, and energy use reduction. Uh, much like HSB, the SWEET program opens in fall, winter, um, so please be mindful of that time frame and this program. Uh, and again, you can always do a, a, a search CDFA suite to get um, information about when that's opening up. And then uh, I do want to make sure that you are well aware that, I mean, I've been talking about uh, resource conservation districts, but one of our, our fabulous conservation partners is the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, sometimes it's very confusing because often RCDs and NRCS are in the same office and you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them. And so oftentimes people think we're the NRCS or they think they're the RCD. Um, but just be aware that we're, we're <coughs> excuse me, we're separate organizations with similar um, conservation missions. Um, so RCDs are local unit of governments. NRCS is, uh, a, I'll call it a division of the United States Department of Agriculture, which is a federal level um, entity, of course. So um, the great thing about NRCS is that they are local, even though they are funded through, um, through USDA and ultimately through the Farm Bill, um, but they're local, so they understand your needs just like we do. Uh, one of the more popular programs that NRC has is their Environmental Quality and Incentives Program, or EQIP. Um, EQIP is great because it addresses any number of different resource concerns. Um, if you're interested in, in EQIP, you can apply uh, year round. It's on sort of a rolling basis. So if uh, for whatever reason um, you get in late, you can't apply for the first round, <clears throat> you'll come up for consideration in the second round. Um, there's usually, a, there's going to be a local RCD, local NRCS office somewhere around you. So, um, you know, ours is uh, ours is in Oxnard Harbor here in Ventura County, um, and our local district conservationist or local DC is Don Athman. Um, so if you're near this area, this information is relevant to you. If you're not in our area, however, uh, again, look up NR NRCS and um, find the, the nearest office next to you and get in contact with your local uh, district conservationist. Um, so I am um, nearing the end of my, my presentation. I, I've already run over, I think, <laughs> quite a bit. So if you're, if you're interested in learning more about financial and technical assistance, please feel free to email me. There's my uh, email uh, information there. Um, or reach out to a local RCD uh, if I'm just outside your area. Um, you can reach out to your local RCD also and sign up for their newsletter. <clears throat> that'll, that'll keep you aware of upcoming opportunities. Um, 
As I indicated earlier, please be, be mindful of CDFA opportunities. A great way of knowing what's coming is to sign up for their notifications. Um, reach out to your local R, uh, NRCS. Sorry, I keep saying RCB. Reach out to your local NRCS, um, your local district conservationist. See if you can get some information about EQIP and just start the conversation about your, uh, your resource concerns. Um, if you have a local farm bureau, please sign up for that. Uh, their newsletter so you can um, keep abreast of what they're up to. Um, and then if you have a cooperative extension office near you, um, please make sure to reach out to them as well. Um, they can offer you, you know, technical support. They can help you um, figure out what might be going on in terms of your operations. If you've got pest issues or if you've got, um, you know, leaf chlorosis or something, they can help um, steer you in the right direction to address those, those challenges. Uh, meanwhile, please help us help you. Um, it's good for you to reach out to us um, with some specific uh, operational needs in mind um, so that we can sort of start a conversation about that and then go from there. So give some consideration to what you feel your operational needs are. Where do you want to be in another year, another two years? Um, and it's not just sort of operational uh, needs um, that you you should only focus on. Please be mindful of what your environmental goals are maybe you want to do a little bit more pollinator habitat maybe you want to build up your soil health uh, in addition to be able to use some of the standard conservation practices to you know reduce your your irrigation needs um, and then ultimately what are your land stewardship objectives i mean how do you want the land to look um, and what are the kinds of things that you would like to do to achieve that vision um, as a land steward um, these are all things that can sort of help us understand where you are now, where you want to be later. Um, going back to that previous example, um, by understanding where you are and where you need to be um, and what your challenges are, we can be better positioned to be able to stack those resources in the most um, sensible way to get you to your, your final goals um, for your operation. And so with that, I've um, gone on half an hour, much longer than I probably should have. I apologize about that. Um, but again, first, thank you so much, everyone, for your service. Um, I'm very appreciative of that. And I also just want um, to thank you for your time and your attention, your patience, um, <laughs> sitting through this long Zoom call uh, or this Zoom meeting. I hopefully will be able to join, as I indicated earlier, to answer any questions. But feel free to reach out. And again, as I said, um, make sure to be reaching out to other conservation partners, not just the, the RCDs. And so with that, I'm going to sign off and I'm going to try to do this gracefully, but um, I'm not sure that I'll be able to do that. <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone again for your time and attention. All right, unfortunately, uh, Jamie is not able to join us today. He is actually out in the field. So I think we all can understand that and appreciate that. Um, but he gave you a ton of information. Um, also his, his email address, if you wanna reach out to him specifically, um, feel free to do that. I didn't see any questions pop up in the chat or in the um, Q and A. Um, if you do have any questions about anything that was presented today, including Farmer Veteran Coalition's programs, you can uh, feel free to type that in right now. I am going to share with you our um, final farm demos coming up next Tuesday, and that'll take place at Nauman Family Farms in Oxnard, California. And we'll be learning about their conservation practices and how they manage uh, drip irrigation and tillage and crop rotations, cover crops and soil analysis. So if you are interested in joining us for that um, final farm demonstration webinar, I will post that link on how to register in the chat here in a moment. And then I am going to ask if you can please complete the post event survey. Again, um, it really helps us improve our programming, um, make program changes to better suit your needs and um, also you can win a $50 gift card. So who can't use that right now? So there's the registration link for the next farm demo. We hope you can join us. And then I will also, I will post the um, survey in the chat, but you will also get a follow-up email with a recording and the post survey in that email. So no worries if you don't get a chance to actually click on the link, um, you will receive an email with all this information after 
um, this event. You'll actually receive it tomorrow morning. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Apple of Sellers, uh, Peter Work, for sharing um, your beautiful vineyard. Um, thank you for Jamie Whiteford at Ventura County Resource Conservation District. We really appreciate the information you shared. Thank you, Randy Ryan, for filming the event. Um, he did such a wonderful job filming. And uh, once again, thank you so much uh, from the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts for allowing us this opportunity to share this information with you all. Thank you all for joining. I, I really appreciate it and hope you all have a lovely day.